Hello, I'm Michael Graziano, and welcome to part three of How to Compose a Symphony. In this video, we'll start the orchestration. We already have a sketch of the first movement, and now let's build up the full orchestra, layer by layer. Let's start with the first 12 measures. If we can orchestrate just that in one video, we'll be doing well. To remind you, let's listen to the first 12 measures of the sketch. The biggest event in that opening is the contrast between the first quiet version of the theme and the repetition. If we want that second statement to jump up and be mighty, we'll have to make the first statement quiet. We don't have a lot of orchestral forces to work with here. We can't pile on trumpets and drums, so everything depends on a strategic use of contrast. We'll have the merest whisper of a counter melody, as light as can be, like a breeze whispering under the melody. When students first start orchestrating, they want to jump right away into the big orchestra sound, the tutti sound. Tutti means all. But the full orchestra segments are the least interesting in many ways. When all the instruments are playing together, they constrain each other and you don't have a lot of room for choice. The creative choices happen more often in the delicate passages, when only a few instruments play at a time. Let's listen to that counter melody and make sure it has its own integrity. Now let's listen to the two together. I like that unassuming, quiet opening. I know I've mentioned to you before that classical music has a motor, in this piece an eighth note motor. The counter melody is giving us the motor. Where the counter melody slows down into quarter notes, the main tune picks up with the eighth notes. The rhythm is steady until this moment, the first cadence, the first resting point, which is emphasized by pausing the motor. Now I'm putting in markings. When you write for strings, you should always be thinking about bowing. I'm putting in bowing marks here. You start with a down bow. Down bows lend themselves to a little bit of emphasis and strength, to the downbeat of a measure. Up bows lend themselves to a lighter, de-emphasized sound. I like to listen to the music and play an invisible violin until the bowing feels right. I look like an idiot fiddling in the air, but it works for me. I'm filling in a version of that same counter melody. We still want something quiet. We haven't reached the loud part yet, but we also want something different. Orchestration should always be moving, always changing. Every few measures, you should be thinking, what can I do here to change the texture? What can I add or subtract? Bop, right there. Something for your ear to catch on and say, ooh, there's another thing going on at the same time. Let me put in musical markings. We'll have it step up a teeny bit in loudness. The music is beginning to swell a little bit here. And now, let's listen to those first eight measures. Mm -hmm. 
It's very nice. But you haven't heard anything yet. Now for the mighty part. Let's concentrate on the strings first. The string orchestra is the foundation, the framework. Historically, symphonies began as string orchestras with a few extra instruments for color. If you're not sure how to orchestrate a passage, write it for the strings first, and then, if you need to, you can always take away string parts as you add other instruments. Here, the firsts and seconds can take that octave doubling and play the melody. The cellos and basses can take the bottom. And the violas can play the motor, the counter melody. I like how the violas hang around middle C. It gives the passage a filled in solid feel. Let me put in some markings here. And let's listen. So far, so good. Now for the rest of the orchestra. I want to start with the horns. Horns are one of the most complex instruments in the orchestra. Personally, I think they were the first discovered key to real orchestration. Instruments can form alliances with each other, resonating and blending, and horns may be the most versatile, forming alliances with almost anything, bridging between upper strings and lower strings, between strings and woodwinds, between different specific woodwinds, they do very well by themselves, too. I'm going to mark them mezzo piano. This is our first moment of loudness, but we don't want to overdo it. Let's listen to the horns. Very simple, outlining the basic harmony notes. These are horns in F. Mozart would have used horns in C here because this piece is in C, but the modern horn in F plays everything these days. Pretend you have one of those old hand horns that can play only limited notes, and sticking to those basic framework notes is what gives the horn much of its classical power. Now let's go for the woodwinds. A standard Romantic orchestra would also have clarinets, but I didn't want to thicken the sound too much here. A really big orchestra might have three flutes, three oboes, an English horn, six clarinets, a bass clarinet, three bassoons, and a contrabassoon. We have just one flute, two oboes, and two bassoons. Here I'm outlining the chords, very simply, to give a kind of ringing wall of sound behind the string orchestra. In my view, Haydn never appreciated the bassoon. He uses it mostly as a bass line, often doubling the strings. Notice I've got them mainly in the upper part of their range, where they have their nicest sound. Sometimes the bassoons and horns belong together and form an alliance. But in this passage, it's the bassoons and the oboes, mostly. The single flute highlights the top. Now let's listen to the woodwinds and horns together. When you have the distribution right, they blend nicely and feel good. The horns here also help to fill in and blend the sound. With all of that, 
we have the full orchestration of the first 12 measures, and let's listen to it. Wow, that really pops! Orchestration really is like painting in a pencil sketch with oil colors. Next time, we'll continue with the orchestration. It may take us many videos to finish the movement, and I hope you'll join me.